Let's open our Bibles to John chapter 21. Today we finish the Gospel of John. We've been going through this Gospel for about a whole, uh, the, the span of a pregnancy, almost nine months. And uh, that's actually when I started being the pastor here. And, you know, it's, it's an awesome book to start with. I think Levi Lesko also also started with the, with this gospel, and it was he asked a question. You know, how many of you guys were here? How, actually, raise your hand if you were here at the beginning of, of this gospel. Here, okay. and that's good in a sense. If you weren't here, that means we're growing. Okay, yeah, there were some subtractions, obviously, and I know there's winter visitors and all that. Um, but you know, this this is an awesome book. I'm just privileged to be able to teach it, to just finish it as well. Chapter twenty, though, it ended sort of like it was the the end, like it was the last message. Turn your turn the page there, chapter 20. Look at verse 30. Verse 30, it says, And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. That's a good close. That's a good ending. There are some commentators that say, that chapter 21 was written uh, sometime later, still by John, the, uh, the Apostle John here. Maybe uh, he, he used one of his disciples to, you know, to pan it down with his oversight, nonetheless, and the Holy Spirit inspiring it. But I was going to title this message, uh, uh, One Last Thing, because see, Jesus appears to them again. He appeared to them twice already. Remember, they were possibly in the upper room. They were behind locked doors. He just pops in there. Sort of what I like to call an instant transmission. He just pops from one place to another, defying space and time, and, and he's like, a peace to you, right? He just appears to them. I mean, I imagine they're drinking coffee, and Jesus appears, and they're like spilling all, all over themselves. Obviously, that doesn't happen. But he's there. He pops in twice. First time, Thomas is not there. He misses the first church, uh, uh, you know, the first church, first church service, and then Jesus pops in again. And then Thomas is there, and he's like, Thomas? Touch me. You know, you wanted to see, you wanted to see me, you wanted to feel me. Put your fingers between, uh, put your hands between the, my nail scarred hands. You know, here, put your hands in here as well. The Bible doesn't say that he did do that. The Bible says that he believed. He got on his knees and he says, he prays them for who he really is, right? He says, my Lord and my God, my Curios and my Theon, right? Just proclaiming the reason this book was written, that you might believe. Focusing on the person and work of Jesus Christ. And that's, that's what it does in us. We are to believe. We grow in our faith through this gospel, especially. I titled this message, uh, Life Lessons by the Beach, because they are going to be uh, at the shoreline there in Galilee. And, um, you know, life lessons are pretty good. We are all, we're not exempt from them, unless you, you, you're just a really stubborn person and you never learn from your mistakes. The Bible is written that we might learn from the mistakes of those, uh, or, you know, the, the fathers that have made them. Right? That we should learn from them so we don't just step into that. But again, there are life lessons we learn. I'm going to give you five life lessons that I've learned <clears throat> since, I, uh, since I was a kid. Number one, look before you drink. When I was a kid, um, I, I, I would uh, go to the kitchen, just grab a cup and drink it if it had water, even if it wasn't mine. One time I did that and uh, I had bubbles in my mouth. There was soap. It was a soapy cup. And I went outside. My mom, it's in Mexico and my mom's got a hose and she's, I'm trying to get it all out. So... I'm, I always emphasize with my, my son, too, is like, if, if a cup has been out there for overnight, just throw it out. You know, especially sometimes you have lint in there. That's just me. I'm picky. Uh, second life point, personal life lesson, don't take your mask off till you're sure the game is over. I learned that yesterday. You can't see it, but I got, a, a, uh, I got shot by a paintball right here. Anyway, we were playing, right? And uh, I, thought, I thought it was cool, and I went up, I went up behind Louie and, and, and Kai, and I shot him. I thought it was over. I started walking out. I take my mask off. I stepped out of the, the field. I thought it was safe, and I get shot right here. And, uh, you know, lesson to be learned. Don't step out. Make sure the game is over. Life less, personal life lesson number three. You know those little weights that they use for fishing? And what are they? The sinkers, right? One, of them, one time I was playing in my house, and I was uh, just throwing it up, and it got stuck on a, on a light bulb socket, an empty light bulb socket. So I want to get it, and it just shocked me. And, you know, it's like, like the Roadrunner and Coyote, right? When it, it, your face turns black, right? So lesson there, don't do that. What's another one? One time we're, uh, we're going up uh, a hill over here by the foothills, 
and I had my Pacifica. My Pacifica is not a four by four, but I saw Andrew. You know, he was he was going up that hill pretty easy. He has a four by four. So my wife's with me. The kids are in the back. I'm like, I'm gonna take it. Cynthia's like, don't take it. Just park here. Walk up there. Tell Andrew to drive you. Like, no, I'm gonna take it. And I, sure enough, I, I I got stuck up there. They had to pull me out. And you know, don't do it unless you have a four by four. Fifth personal life lesson. I I did this one about three four months ago. I, I did my first uh, wedding right. And it was in San Luis somewhere, and this, this couple was kind of particular about, you know, sometimes there's symbolism. You, you got the, what is it, the, the rope and the knot and all that. She wanted this, this thing with the oil and the wheat, right? And I didn't research too much into it. So anyway, I just said, here's the oil, here's the wheat, this is what it means. But they wanted me to sort of pour it in there and, and give some symbolism. But I could tell she was kind of upset when they were saying the I do's. So uh, lesson to be learned there, do your homework before you uh, join two people together for life. Those are my personal lessons. And I'm, gonna, I'm also going to give you five life lessons that Jesus taught his disciples here before uh, uh, leaving them. And there are more here. You're going to see them. But these are the ones I jotted down. Verses one, verses 1 to 3, we see night fishing with Peter. Look at verse 1. It says, after these things, well, the things I just told you, the recap of last week, Jesus pops up. He, jo he shows up to Mary first, Mary Magdalene. And then he pops up with the disciples. He pops up with some other ladies. Uh, the disciples on the road to Emmaus. You know, different appearances everywhere. He's just showing up. After these things, this is what it's referring to there. Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And in this way, he showed himself. So we see John here. He's about to tell, tell a story. He gives us a setting. It's the Sea of Tiberias. It's up in Galilee. And now he's going to tell us who all is there. Who are the characters? Who are present? Seven disciples. Look at verse 2. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, that's five. One of the sons of Zebedee was John, uh, which is a writer here. And two other guys. And two other of his disciples were together. Who were they? I don't know. It doesn't say, right? But we can put ourselves in there. You know, we, we can put, oh, well, that, that's uh, Albert and, and Aaron, or that's uh, such and such, right? Because it applies to us. This message is just applicable for for us as it was for them. Look at verse 3. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. I like how the King James says it. The King James actually says, I go a fishing. And the disciples are there with him. He's going to take off. That's his hobby. That's his profession. That's what he did best. And look what they say to them. They said to him, we're going with you also. See, Peter was a leader. Peter uh, would be the first one to take initiative and the people would just follow no, Peter was not the first pope. That's, there, you can't even read that into this. However, he did have, he, he was the first one to do certain things. The question arises though, why didn't they wait for Jesus? Jesus had already told them to wait for him in Galilee. In Matthew 28, 10, it says, Then Jesus said to, me, to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brethren to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. Right? They were supposed to be in Galilee. Jesus was supposed to pop up sometime, somewhere in the vicinity. Jesus just goes fishing. It, does, it doesn't say Jesus just leaves, leaves the ministry and takes off back to his old profession. It doesn't say that. Some commentators believe that. They did, eat, they did need to eat. They did need to work for their livelihood. So maybe it's getting kind of late. Let's go get some fish and have some dinner. Maybe that's what they're doing here. I don't know. I don't want to be too judgmental on Peter here just yet. Life lesson number one. We are to congregate with each other, not isolate from each other. And what I, see, what I see here is that you got this guy. There's always going to be somebody in the group that's a leader. I think Steve's good with that as far as uh, doing stuff. You know, let's go paintballing or let's go bowling, whatever, right? I think he's good in that. But the job of the rest, the rest of us, we should be like, well, we'll go or not. You know, depending on our schedule, sometimes we're busy, we have other plans. But that's something that God loves, you know, fellowship. I see my kids and I don't like, my ki I don't like to see my kids fight. And I'm pretty sure you guys don't and didn't when you had them at home. I think the same way with God. When he sees us fellowshipping, he just, you know, he's happy. He's joyous that we are fellowshipping. Actually, that's what the, the word uh, ecclesia means, the church. We're, we're called out, right? We're called out to fellowship. We're called out. We're an assembly. We're supposed to be together for a reason, right? There's no such thing as Rambo Christians. You're not, you don't just pop up and base every now and then, right? You're not just out there doing a mission and then you, you come back. No, God calls us to assemble, to do things together. It's okay to go uh, 
you know, paintballing. It's okay to do other stuff that doesn't necessarily have to be street witnessing other stuff. Right? So we see here, Peter's like, let's go fishing. These guys, let's go, we'll go with you. They tag along. And this is one of my favorite parts here, uh, the next uh, sentence here. It says, they went out, okay, he's about to tell us the story, and immediately got into the boat. Okay, they got, they got their gear, they're getting into the boat, it's getting interesting, and that night they caught nothing. That, that's it. It doesn't give us any more details. I thought he was going to just, you know, break out with the whole paragraph of how they caught nothing, how they swung the line or the net for that matter because they were throwing nets. Nope, none of that stuff. Why? Well, that, that's, that wasn't the point. Yesterday, too, I was like ready to, uh, you know, I had my mask on and I had my, my, my paintball gun and I got my gear and then I'm getting ready with these guys. We're making a game plan. Okay, you're going to go left. I'm going to go right. And I'm looking at Rob Richardson so he can say go and start, right? So he says go and immediately I get shot in the mouth. There's, that's the end of the story. You know, and that was just the first round. But this is what's happening here. They go out there, they go fishing, and they fail. And there's a reason I believe that the Lord allowed them uh, to fail. Here's a question. Where would you be right now if you would have gone back to your old life? I think we can dismiss this point because it is a possibility. What if he did? What if Peter was going, trying to go back to his life, old life? It doesn't say that Jesus addressed Peter specifically and encouraged him. Because remember... Try to put yourself in Peter's shoes here. Peter denied Jesus three times. Okay? When Jesus found Peter again, when he saw him again, uh, Peter was locked behind doors. Right? He was behind closed doors and they were locked. He's, Peter was in, in fear of the, of the Jews. So just imagine Jesus finding you. It's, it's sort of like if today you were in some kind of sin, right? And then Jesus just pops up right there and he sees you and you're before him, right? You know, you're convicted. Why was, why was Peter going back to... Uh, to fishing here? Why did God allow him not to not to be successful in fishing? Why does God allow us not to be successful in certain things? Second life lesson uh, here. God permits empty nets. God permits empty nets. He wants you to surrender to his will. Okay? That's one of the reasons. Look at the prodigal son, right? He requests his inheritance from his father. His father lovingly gives it to him. The, the, the son just blows it away. He spends it on... Uh, on the lust of the flesh and whatnot. Then at the end, when he wastes all his money, when he's empty-handed, he's out there with the pigs in the mire, just you know, wasting his life away, suffering, reaping what he sowed. And when does he come back to the Father? When he's empty-handed, right? I think God uses us, uses certain things, allows us to get into certain things, so we can see, look, there's nothing out there for you in the world anymore. You try to go back to the world, you're going to fail. You're going to be miserable. I try to, I try to do that earlier on in my life. You know, I... Uh, um, you know, as, as a young believer, you know, I, I sort of uh, compromised. I was like, well, the Bible doesn't say you, you, uh, you can't drink. It just says drunkards will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. So I was trying to, no, I was trying to find the loophole. So I was like, I'm going to witness to my, my cousin's husband and, you know, share a beer as long as I don't get drunk, right? Wrong. You know, eventually, one beer turns into two beers. That's why the, the, the principle is don't have one and you will never have two. And eventually, you won't get drunk, right? Don't compromise your walk with the Lord. So God per permits empty nets in order that we might come back to Him. And second point, second sub point, because He wants you to know that apart from Him, failure is guaranteed. Didn't Jesus tell them earlier, apart from me, you can do nothing, right? He didn't say some things. He didn't say all things. He said nothing. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Unless the Lord, the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Psalm 127.1. Again, we need Jesus in the things we do. I think in James chapter 4, it also talks about, uh, it gives a conversation of, uh, a hypothetical conversation of people saying, okay, we're going to go into this city and we're going to do this and that and we're going to grow, right? But then James is like, you know, if you should, instead you should say, if it's the Lord's will, we'll do this and we'll do that. And God sort of wants us at His will. He doesn't want us over here just yet. We, gotta, we always got to be, a, 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 you know, one step behind Him, not in front of Him. Third reason I think God allows empty nets is because He has prepared you for something else. See, this was uh, sort of like a deja vu moment because when He originally called Peter, He was also fishing. He told, uh, what did He tell him? Matthew chapter 4, verse 18. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then He said to them, 
follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Fishers of men. See, they were doing something um, natural. He gave them something spiritual. He gave them a spiritual uh, mission, ministry there. They immediately left their nets and followed him. It's deja vu moment here, right? Jesus, Jesus is about to bless them with fish, but he's in, in order to try to give them an illustration. The same way, you and I, okay? We, we have natural abilities. I still have a secular job. I still do stuff, you know? God, God wants us to do this. We need to provide for our families, right? And the Bible says in, in Proverbs of Psalms, it says, the man doesn't work, shouldn't feed, should, does not deserve to eat. We should work. Nonetheless, we have a ministry. We have a new ministry. 2 Corinthians 5 tells us, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. That's you and I, if you're saved. Old things have passed away. You know, whatever sinful lifestyle you had. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. So if you are indeed a new creation, you have a ministry, a ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. To one, to one point to another. You know, you might not be an evangelist, but to one degree or another, you can teach somebody the gospel. Okay? The Great Commission is for, for all of us. Now, the point is, we are fishers of men. Let's continue here, verse 4 to 14. Now Jesus is going to give them breakfast. Breakfast uh, with Jesus here. You're about to see Jesus is grilling, broiling some fish. And he's got some bread there too, some flat bread. Some broiled fish tacos. Verse 4. But when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. So, some, for some reason, they couldn't recognize Jesus' face there. He was a hundred yards away. Maybe that could be a factor. Or maybe God just divinely did it so they couldn't recognize him. We don't know. Yet we know that he's in his glorified body already and he likes to eat. He's hungry. Verse 5, Then Jesus said to them, Children, have you any food? For from, from, from the, the land, you got the guys on the boat and Jesus is like, Hey, you guys got any food? He was referring to fish. He was either telling them, Hey, do you guys have any fish I can buy? Or he was, he was telling him, you guys haven't caught anything, have you? And the word here for boys, you know, it's sort of literally lads. Hey, lads, you guys haven't caught anything, have you? Have you any food, it says. They answered him, no. Notice, they're probably uh, kind of frustrated. They're probably fishing all night. Nothing happened. They weren't about to give details. They're just, they're just short. No, we didn't catch anything. A couple months ago, we went on a fishing trip for the men up in uh, San Diego. It was for sort of a half-day thing, and we were out there deep-sea fishing. It was my first time. I took a bunch of medodrin, and it didn't work. The only thing I caught was nausea. No fish. No fish at all. And I can relate to them in that sense. Verse 6 says, And he said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast, and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. You notice how that, that verse says, you know, apart from me, you can do nothing. And then we can draw in the other one, Philippians, with Paul. You know, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It was through God's direction. Whether God said, whether Jesus said, throw it on the left side, the front side, the back side, doesn't matter which side, as long as you're following God's direction there. They were successful. He exceeded their expectations. This net was full of fish, and it wasn't breaking. It says, so they cast and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. A bunch of fish, abundantly blessed here. Verse 7, Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved, John, to Peter, <clears throat> said to Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it. Now some say that he was sort of uh, fishing undressed, or he was fishing in his trousers. I don't know. We do know that he's getting dressed now, and what does he get dressed for? To get wet. He says he puts on his outer garment, and he plunges into the sea. So I can tell you that Peter was, uh, was against skinny dipping, but he wasn't against uh, skinny fishing. <laughs> Anyways, another thing we see here is that John, John the Apostle, is the first guy to recognize Jesus. Remember last week? 
He beats Peter in a race. He gets there first. But he doesn't walk into the, the gravesite and, and, and to the, the grave there. He, he just stays outside and he looks. But he's the first one to recognize something. He recognizes that Jesus is not there. And he, the Bible says that he believes. Same thing here. John is the first one to recognize that it was Jesus. But the first one to take action is Peter. He literally just jumps off of the, the boat there and he starts swimming 100 yards. He has that passion for Jesus. I'm asking you today, do you have that passion for Jesus when you recognize Jesus is calling you? Do you jump out? How far do you go for Jesus when he calls you out? The other guys, they're like, in verse 8 it says, The other disciples came in a little boat, for they were not far from land, but about 200 cubits, dragging the net with fish. Dragging the net with a heavy net. Verse 9, Then as soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid on it, and bread. So Jesus already had his fish going. He already had his, he had provided for himself. It, it wasn't part of a, the, the disciples' catch. He was already broiling some fish there. He had breakfast ready to go. And this is similar to what happens earlier when he feeds the 5,000. It was probably more like 12,000, right? He feeds him dinner, right? With a few loaves of, you know, some fish and a few loaves of bread from, from a boy that was around with the basket. And what happens the next day? The people that had been fed, they crossed the lake looking for Jesus. Why? Because they wanted a continental breakfast. They wanted food again from Jesus. And now I sort of see this here. Jesus is now feeding, uh, his, uh, you know, feeding them some fish and some bread there, but especially for his disciples. One last time for, for fellowship and communion here. He's about to teach him something as well. But notice it says they saw a fire of coals there. No doubt this is about to start... Um, Reminding Peter, because where was Peter at when he denied Jesus three times? It was by a fire, right? And Jesus is sort of going to start talking to Peter about certain things, and I'm no doubt it's going to be reminding him of his denial. Now he's by a fire again, and now he's presented with the one he denied. Verse 9, Then as soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid on it, and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish which you have just caught. Bring some of the fish which you have just caught. You see, part of being a, 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 you know, fulfilling the Great Commission is not just, you know, accept Jesus, see you later, peace, right? We're not all called to be Phillips, you know, get raptured up somewhere else to the next mission, right? Sometimes those people are going to be hanging around. Sometimes they're going to follow you to church. Our part is to bring him to the feet of Jesus as much as we can, just like this feet, the, the, the fish here, right? He's like, bring some of the fish which you have just caught. Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to land. Simon Peter was probably strong, full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many, the net was not broken. Why 153? I don't know. There's some theories out there. Some say that, that, that was a, uh, there were 153 languages or 153 races during the time that they were going to reach with the gospel. I don't know. Call, uh, check on what Chuck Missler says about that. He's probably, you know, will give you some ideas there. Nonetheless, we know there's a lot of fish. We know the net can hold them there. The gospel can hold anybody. Okay? Variety. Nothing can take us out of the hands of God. <clears throat> Let's continue. So they're there. They put the fish before, uh, before the Lord. 153 fish. Big ones, not little ones. Verse 12. Jesus said to them, Come and eat breakfast. He's inviting them now. Come have fellowship with me. See, to eat with somebody, man, you guys were reconciled. Man, you guys were good. You were cool. They're your friends. Come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? Knowing that it was the Lord. Remember, he sort of he doesn't exactly look like he used to, but they knew it was him. Verse 13, Jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to them, and likewise the fish. This is now the third time Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. Remember the first two times in the upper room there? This is the third time. Life lesson number three. Jesus wants to have breakfast with you. He wants to have breakfast with you, right? And maybe one day we will have breakfast in the millennial kingdom, right? But what can you do now? What's second best now? Well, I think second best is waking up early in the morning, seeking him with a fresh cup of coffee and your Bible open or tea, whatever. You know? A time where you can just isolate yourself from distractions. A time where you can just, it can just be you and God's word. You know, seeking Him through prayer, seeking Him through meditation on the Word of God. You know, an alone time. Because you know what? The day has a lot of things for you. 
well, whether you work outside of the job or you're a stay-at-home mom, you got to either deal with kids or deal with uh, people in the workplace. Sometimes the stress is just the same. So you need the, what is it? You know, you need to ask for the, the armor of God. You need the shield of faith, the sword of the spirit, the feet shot with the gospel, the helmet of salvation, breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, all this stuff, we need it at the beginning of our days. We don't know what the way to day, uh, what, the, what awaits for us outside of our doorsteps. So here's some, a, couple, a couple questions for you guys. Number one, do we invite him into our day through prayer? Two, do we seek his will for the day before we get to work? Do we ask for the full armor before setting foot outside? Do we open the scriptures and meditate on his word? Now, I, I did this thing where, um, you know, for, for a while I wanted to, like, you know, just open the door for more uh, prayer meetings because we only, we, we only had one. It was uh, Mondays at 6 p.m. And, uh, you know, that's still going on. We still have minded prayer meetings in the back, 6 p.m. But I opened up one on Wednesday and on Friday, and they're still going on. But usually those, those didn't, I don't know, they didn't prosper so much. Uh, so it was just me and a couple of guys. So instead we took those out and I just made those my personal prayer times with, with the guys just to pour into them and for them to pour into me and just glean from each other. So now I have a Bible study at home on uh, Wednesday mornings at 6 a.m. And the, re the reason this is important, the reason I'm mentioning it is because we all can meet Jesus together in the morning for breakfast. Okay? And it's just an hour, so time of praying and a time of the Word of God. And then we go our separate ways. I go to you know, my secular job, or either study the message for Sunday, and they go to their jobs. But you know what? When we leave this place, we leave encouraged. We leave having a strong, hearty breakfast with Jesus, you know? Wheaties with Jesus. Verse 15. 15 to 25, now we're going to see Peter's uh, ordination. Peter's going to get ordained now. Yes, Jesus uh, breathed the Holy Spirit upon them, and yes, he gave them the mission to uh, confidently say, if you repent, your sins are forgiven. If you don't repent, you're still in your sins. But Jesus still had to personally uh, deal, deal with some issue with Peter. Okay? Peter had denied him three times, but Jesus is now going to ask him three times if he loves him. And he's going to give him three, uh, it seems like he's giving him three, uh, three uh, what is it, uh, encouragement in his future office here. Verse 15 says, So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And the Greek word here is agape or agapao, which means, you know, uh, an unconditional love, a sacrificial love. Do you love me? And he says, more than this, these, do you love me more than these? Now, is he referring to the fish? Because the fish were set before him. Is Jesus saying, do you love me more than the catch here, than your boat, than your profession? Do I come before your, your, uh, your things? Or is Jesus saying, and this is what I personally believe, when he says, do you love me more than these, he was referring to the rest of the disciples. Because Peter had boasted before that he loved Jesus, that he would die for Jesus. In a sense, he was saying, you know, I'm not going to deny you. Maybe these guys over here will, but not me. Was Jesus trying to sort of uh, direct Peter's attention to something? Was he trying to teach him something here before he, he throws him into the ministry there? A good question, though, is, is Jesus number one in your life? Is it evident that you love Jesus? See, because love is not a state of mind, right? It's not a state of mind. It's not necessarily an emotion. It's an action. John, the same John that's talking here, tells us that later on in his epistle, 1 John 3. My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and truth. And by this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. Okay? Not just in word and tongue, but in deed and in truth. Let's continue here. He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. The funny thing here is that he's not responding with the same kind of love. He's responding with a phileo love, a brotherly love. He says, in essence, Jesus says, do you agape me? And he says, yes, Lord, you know I am fond of you. Yes, Lord, you know I'm your friend. Yes, Lord, you know I phileo you. Okay? I think Peter was discouraged here, and he knew he can't fool Jesus. Lord, you know, I phileo you. I can't say I, I agape you. That's why I think Peter was discouraged, and the mission of Jesus here is to encourage him and set him out. He said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. Notice that, that that also comes in three. He said to him again, a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Do you agape me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I'm fond of you. He says, tend my sheep. In verse 17, he said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you 
love me. Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? Now Jesus changes it. Now Jesus says, do you phileo me? It's sort of like, okay, well, do you phileo me? And Peter's like, yes, I phileo you. And he's like, well then, feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. And the, the, the main job of the pastor is to feed the sheep, right? To shepherd the flock. That's the primary role of the pastor. And then and, and the elders, there's some teaching elders and there's non-teaching elders and you got deacons and all that. But I'm going to give you four main responsibilities of a pastor. Number one, settle disputes. There's disputes in the, in the church. The Bible says that Jesus honors church discipline. You know, when, the, when we use that, that one verse in Matthew chapter 18, when, they say, when we say, well, uh, where there are two or more there uh, in the midst is Jesus, right? We usually use that for prayer meetings. We're like, Jesus is there. And yes, he is there. But that's not what it was referring to in Matthew chapter 18. The context there is church discipline. So when two or more are gathered together for church discipline to solve some beef, to solve some problem, Jesus honors that, and he's there. The same thing here. Pastors are there to settle disputes, to be a witness. You know, the Bible says if you if you got a problem with your brother, bring it up to him. If they repent, forgive him. If not, well, you bring another witness, and then if not, if still there's no repentance, you bring the whole church into it. If not, then there's the other thing in 1 Corinthians 5, right? You just let them out in the world and allow the enemy to just empty their lives and hopefully they come back. <clears throat> Hebrews, uh, another job of the pastor is to shepherd the flock. That's what I'm trying to do here, teach the Bible. Part of it. Hebrews 13 says, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls. Okay? I might not be able to help you out in construction or, uh, you know, how to... Uh, build a clubhouse for your kids, but maybe I can help you with your spiritual walk. With, that's, that's what I'm here to help you, to keep watch over your souls. And number four, pastors are to work hard at preaching and teaching the Word of God. And Peter, Peter is the same guy that said in Acts chapter 6, he was part of the, the apostles there, that said, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. And what was happening in Acts chapter 6? There was revival, 3,000 believers out of nowhere. And you know what? When there's a lot of new believers, you're going to need a lot of discipling. You're going to have a lot of problems as well. You know, so we always say, well, we need to be like the early church. When the early church, there was a lot of problems too. A lot of problems. So you, what do they do? They raise up some deacons. And then he says, well, let's raise these guys, these guys up because we need to give ourselves over to prayer and the word of God, to the ministry. That's one of the main roles of the, of the pastor there. In 1 Timothy 5.17, we see that. Work hard at both preaching and teaching. And what if you're not familiar with the Calvary Chapel movement, I'm going to give you three ways of, uh, of teaching. Okay? I usually don't do uh, the textual one uh, till on Wednesdays, and usually on Sundays we just go verse by verse. And that's expository, okay? verse by verse teaching. And it's topical. And that, you know, Rob wants to teach on uh, faith. Well, we're going to teach on faith, and, and then we're going to use a lot of verses. Or if you want to teach on a textual sermon... That's like uh, another one I taught on, um, on faith, unwavering faith. So we went to different texts, but the, the theme was, was uh, faith there. So we go to giant faith with, uh, with uh, uh, David's giant faith, Enoch's walking faith, right? Um, the fireproof faith of, uh, of, of the three, uh, the three uh, Jewish men, right? They would rather be uh, in the fire with Jesus than without him in the shade, Radshak, Meshach, and Abednego, right? So that would be more of a textual, right? Still verse by verse, but not chapter by chapter. So all these things, you know, every, the, the pastor has to get prepared to be ready in season and out of season, and that's why it says it takes work. Life lesson number four, horizontal service springs forth from vertical love. Notice that progression. He says, do you love me? Okay, do this. Do you love me? Do this. Do you love me? Do this, right? Feed my sheep, tend my lambs. Again, horizontal service springs forth from vertical, uh, from vertical love. So if you're trying to love people without having that direct connection with God, you're going to fail. You need to have that first love, that agape love of God, and then you can you know, fulfill your second ministry, love your neighbor as yourself. Let's continue here in verse 18. Most assuredly I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wish. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. Was Jesus telling Peter here, hey, when you get older, you, they're going to put you in a nursing home, you're not going to want to shower, but they're going to make you shower? Is that what he's saying? He was telling him how he was going to die. And, um, you know, he, he tells us in the next verse that that's what he's saying. This he spoke signifying by what death he would glorify God. 
Tradition says he was crucified upside down. He chose, not, he, thought, he thought it unworthy to be crucified as Lord and Savior. It says here, and when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Notice how Jesus doesn't sugarcoat the calling. Sometimes we say, you know, Jesus wants to give you a, a perfect life. You're going to have a, you know, a, an awesome life. You're going to get a good paying job, you know, live your best life now, right? That's not what Jesus says here. He says, you're going to die, follow me. He gives it to him straight out. Elsewhere, Jesus says, you know, unless you hate your mother and father, you know, you're not worthy to follow me. Was Jesus saying to literally hate your mom and dad? No. He was saying, you put, the right, you put my relationship with you first before any other ones. Especially, you know, strong relationships like mother and father. Carry your cross daily if you're going to be his disciple. He gives it to him straight. So you're not surprised when trials do come and the, the you know, tough gets going there. Matthew 26, 33, it says, Peter answered and said to him, Even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. John 13, Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for your sake. Notice that Jesus is now tell, bringing that up again. He's saying, Peter, the first time you said it, you were wrong. You didn't know what you were saying. But now I'm trying to encourage you here, Peter. And you know what? You're going to get your, your wish. You are going to die for me eventually as a martyr. And nobody dies for somebody unless they truly believe in him. Nobody dies... Jesus, Peter would not die for Jesus unless he was being faithful. And this is sort of like an encouragement that he was trying to, to impose upon Peter here. Well, how come in Acts chapter 12, that's, I call that the, the wormy chapter because that's the one our worms ate Herod. But there we see Peter, he's locked up. He's in prison, he's chained up, he's sentenced to die like James. He should be worried, right? No, he was asleep. Why was he asleep? Well, he's probably still young here and he's like, well, Jesus said I was going to die when I get old. Uh, so uh, I'll be okay. And he is okay. He gets delivered from that. Verse 20, Then Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following, who also had leaned on his breast at the supper, and said, Lord, who is this one who betrays you? Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, Oh, Lord, what about this man? What about John? How is he going to die? Verse 22, Jesus said to him, If I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? You follow me. You know what Jesus is telling him? He's telling him here, focus on your calling, not on John's calling. Who cares about John right now? You know, I'll, I'll deal with John later. John has his own calling. And Peter is like, you know, I don't want to just be the, one, the only one to die. I want him to do it too. God wants you to focus on your calling, not on another's. Here's the next point or the next life lesson, the last one. Life lesson five. Failure is imminent when you focus on another calling Another's calling instead of your own. You've got to focus on your calling, or else you're just going to derail and fall off God's, God's course there. William MacDonald says, Many failures in the Christian service arise from disciples being more occupied with one another than with the Lord himself. Right? In a sense, that's covetousness. In a sense, I think that's idolatry because you've got to put Jesus first, not, not to your neighbor there. It seems Peter was not satisfied with his calling. Nonetheless, Jesus says, What is that to you? You follow me. I like how the expanded version puts it. Jesus answered him, If I want him to live until I come back, that is not your business. What is that to you? You follow me. Philip, the, the Phillips translation, verse 22 says, If it is my wish, return Jesus, for him to stay until I come. Is that your business, Peter? You must follow me. Chuck Smith says, uh, Peter took his eyes off of the Lord and worried about John. We need to keep our eyes on Jesus, not on others. You see, when we look down, we're just going to focus on our situation. When we look side to side, we're going to compare ourselves to others. When we look back, we're going to be discouraged with our failures. But when we look forward and up, we're going to keep our eyes on Jesus and keep pressing on. The same, the same lesson he taught Peter earlier when he walked on water, how come he sank? Because he took his eyes off of Jesus. What did he, he looked down. He looked, at, he looked around at the storm. He looked down at the water, and he started sinking the same way. Keep your eyes on Jesus. You walk far. You'll walk on water. The same way he says you can move mountains, he tells you here, you can walk on water if you keep your eyes on me. You know, you can go forward no matter what circumstances. Verse 23 to 25 to finish the, the sermon here. Then this saying went out among the brethren that this disciple would not die. So there's some rumor along amongst the disciples here. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he would not die. But if I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? This is the disciple who testified of these things and wrote these things. And we know that this testimony 
It's true. John is saying here, he's giving, giving himself credit for writing this. Right? If you didn't know who wrote the Gospel of John, it's John. He'll tell you here. Verse 25, And there are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written in them. Jesus did many other things, and we know that already. We can see it with the rest of the Gospels. You know, and he's going to do many more things. The real question is, what is he going to do in me? Well, what can I do for Jesus before he comes back? You know, there's a lot of talk about the four blood moons and this and that. We don't know the day or the hour, right? Nonetheless, we should live like they live. They thought Jesus was coming back soon. Jesus told them, wait, if, if I decide for him to live, live till I come back, so be it. We don't know. However, we've got to live our lives like he's coming back today, right? That's the, the, the real uh, question there. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you, Father, for, for the Gospel of John, how it really goes out and does what it's supposed to do, Lord. It says that we might believe. It was written that we might believe, Lord, and uh, Father, I believe more because of it. Lord, I thank you again. I pray you give us wisdom and understanding. I pray we might be uh, used by you. Lord, you've commissioned uh, all of us. You've given us the Holy Spirit, and you've given us a ministry. Help us to fulfill it, Lord. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand together.